All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks again for joining us tonight. I'm Melissa Herter. I'm the Assistant Director of Annual Giving and Alumni Relations at the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design. And I'm so glad that you could join us for our Stamps at Home conversation with the artists from the exhibition Story Word Sound Sway. We're all really eager to hear from our panel of alumni artists. And I wanna let you all know that the event will run for an hour until 7 p.m. We'll hold a question and answer period at the end of the session. And we encourage you to submit questions for our panelists ahead of time by using the chat function on your taskbar. We'll also open it up for, your, for you to unmute yourselves as well at the end if you'd like to ask a question directly. But before we get started, a few housekeeping items. So you all have been muted upon entry, and we do ask that you remain so to provide an equal listening experience for all of our attendees. We strongly advise that you select speaker view as well. And we do have um, live transcript available. So if you are interested in viewing those captions, please click on the closed caption at the bottom right of your screen, and then choose show subtitles. We'll also be sharing a recording of today's presentation, including the captioning on our website and social media channels. And I'll also email that to you as well. And for any technical issues at any time during the event, please feel free to use the chat function to send a direct message to me. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce two of my colleagues, Jennifer Junkermeyer Khan and Montagnola Agundepe. They are both co curate co-curators of the Story Word Sound Sway exhibition at the Stamps Gallery. Take it away. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Um, yeah, special thanks, Melissa, and all the folks at Development and Alumni Relations um, for their work on this event. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the CEW Francis and Sydney Lewis Visiting Leaders Fund for their co-sponsorship of the event tonight. And um, of course, a huge thanks to all of our special and honored guests, uh, Professor Andy Puskovic and the artist Sengor Reed, Yvette Rock, Wes Taylor, and Elizabeth Youngblood. Um, for those of you who have not been to Stamps Gallery before, I just want to tell you a little bit about it before we get started. Um, so Stamps Gallery is an extension of the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design and was developed as an incubator and lab for contemporary artists and designers to explore idea, ideas and projects that catalyze social change. Building on the school's strong tradition of excellence, thought leadership, and community engagement, our goal is to develop innovative and scholarly exhibitions, publications, and public programs that foster inclusive platforms for presentation, discussion, and inquiry into the urgent questions and concerns of our time. A commitment to social justice shapes our work that aims to inspire new ways of looking, making, and thinking. Every year we present two to four student exhibitions and three to five exhibitions with renowned artists and designers working locally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, following guidance from university administrators and public health officials in response to COVID-19, Stamps Gallery is open to you on faculty, staff, and students with a valid M card. And if you do have a valid M card and would like to come visit us, you're welcome to do so Tuesdays and Fridays from 2 to 7 p.m. Um, we're unable to welcome the general public to the gallery at this time, but to make up for this, our website has detailed images of all the works in the exhibition um, that can be viewed virtually at the Story Word Sound Sway exhibition page on the Stamps website. Um, and uh, shortly I will drop that link into the chat so you can all check it out. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to the Story Word Sound Sway exhibition co-curator and Stamps School sophomore, Motaniola Agundepe, to tell us a little bit about the exhibition that we organized. Thank you, Jennifer and Melissa. My name is Moteniolo Gundipe, and the StoryWord Sound Sway exhibition is an exhibition of work by 11 Stamp School of Art and Design alumni using performance, movement, text, and sound and design to interrogate systems of oppression and interrupt the status quo. It explores themes of archives, identity, collective memory, storytelling, meshing performance and performativity, and the interplay of the oral and oral in one's experience of the world. An undercurrent of movement explored in multiple variations thread the works together, realized through a variety of methods, including painterly gesture, repetitive mark making, performance, spoken word, ambient sound, and reimagined instruments. The exhibition aspires to pull at loosened threads of the social fabric in crisis, revealing larger complex histories and art discourses nationally and internationally, 
framed through the experiences and the trajectories of Stamps alumni during their time in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The artists in the show include Carissa Bledsoe, Schroeder Cherry, El Shafe the Fala, Masimba Hawati, Caleb Moss, Sangor Reed, Valencia Robin, Yvette Rock, Wes Taylor, Levesta Williams, and Elizabeth Youngblood. Four of those incredible artists we have with us tonight for this event. Thanks, Motaniola. Um, so before we uh, bring on each of the guest artists to speak about their work and, and be in discussion, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's event, uh, Stam School of Art and Design Professor Andy Poskovic. Born in Sarajevo and raised in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Andy Poskovic was educated in Yugoslavia, Norway, and the United States. He studied music and art from an early age and during the 1980s performed traditional music of Western Balkans at festivals throughout Europe and the Middle East. Now he has done so much since that time and now, um, which includes exhibiting worldwide. Um, he's the recipient of numerous and notable grants and fellowships and has, and has, and is, excuse me, and his work is included in permanent public collections around the globe. Perhaps more importantly, post Poskovic's creative practice considers a range of technologies as a way to explore certain characteristics of the printed image, including translation, multiplicity, and seriality. Through his visual work, he seeks to construct representations that suggest broader themes of displa displacement, exile, memory, and re reconciliation. Poskovic will also have work in an upcoming group exhibition, Halal Metropolis, which opens this May at Stamps Gallery. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Andy. Well, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Jennifer, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you, Melissa, for uh, introduction to this wonderful event. Uh, it is pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to the event and thank all of the alumni artists for being here with us today. Uh, let us get started with introductions from the panelists. Uh, if you could give us a brief introduction and tell us a bit about yourself and your work in the exhibition, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, let us start off with uh, Sanger and then we'll move to Yvette. Wes and Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Indy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, my name is Singor Reed. I am an artist and educator. I currently teach drawing and painting and, and this semester photography um, at the Cranbrook Kingswood Upper School uh, in Birmingham, in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, excuse me. And um, I have been practicing artists ever since I graduated from the University of Michigan. I, I actually had my first solo exhibition uh, right after graduation. And um, since that time, I have been working as a, a primarily as a painter. Um, in, in recent years, I have been, uh, I've moved into performance. And, um, you know, I'm, my work in this show is, is really sort of in, indicative of like sort of the three places and that I've been in uh, as an artist for the past three years. Um, you know, doing performance as well as doing uh, figurative painting, which is, is, is something that has been sort of a constant throughout my career. Um, and, and also working uh, in, in painting a little bit more abstractly and, and dealing with um, more gestural movements and mark making in my work. And my primary subject matter has been water. And, and for several years I was painting water um, and I didn't really know why. I, I just wanted to, as, growing up as a city boy, I never have had access to like, you know, like being in water. I always wanted to like be in the ocean. And so it was like, I was doing these paintings um, that allow for me to sort of live vicariously through my paintings. So I, I couldn't be in the ocean, but I could paint the ocean and act like I was in the ocean um, in my studio. And um, in, in more recent uh, uh, years though, I've, I've been thinking a, little, a lot more 
about what water means to me personally um, and, and you know, the role that it plays in my life, uh, the lives of the people in the city of Detroit and, and in the state of Michigan. And, you know, especially with the things that have been happening recently in terms of people's access to fresh, clean water. My, my work has been uh, addressing water on a more personal level, uh, a, a level that deals a little bit more with public health and, and health within, within our community. And we're, we're going to move to Yvette Rock. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. My name is Yvette Rock, and I graduated from University of Michigan uh, with an MFA in painting in 1999. Not that my life started then, but <laughs> that's the context. Um, so, and a friend of Sangor. So we actually have quite a bit in common just hearing you speak, Sangor just being uh, very focused in painting and um, mixed media. And then really the last maybe four years or so um, welcoming performance art into my work. And that really is through uh, my neighbors like Billy Mark, who's a performance artist, musician, really influencing and inspiring me to think about other ways of creating and thinking about art. So. I'm really excited about this show because it kind of has a, a blend of what I've been working on the last maybe five, six years. Uh, you'll see a lot of my mixed media works in the show, these fabric, fabric pieces, and a lot of them come from a series I did called Community Conversations. So it's very important to me to, as an artist, not just make work, but actually have real relationships with people and talking about the issues that I'm making work about. So it's not just like theoretical. I really enjoy um, talking with my neighbors, with my community about important conversations that we should be having. So a lot of these pieces uh, came from and were inspired uh, from a series of, well, from conversations I was having while being in a group called Facing Race. And so it was a very focused group dealing with uh, a lot, you know, we're, pretty much a black and white group. There were a little bit of a mix there, but mainly black and white group of people who were meeting together to have some serious discussion about how to relate with one another. And so out of that, these pieces came forth. And then as well as the performances that I've been doing lately also address issues that, can, that I'm concerned about or that I think about such as justice, uh, land use, and just observing the changes in Detroit that have been going on the last um, several years, I guess, but mainly the last like five, six years. So that's me. Uh, let's see what else I can say. I live in the city with my husband and children. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thank you, Yvette. Mm -hmm. um, I would like us to move to Wes Taylor. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, yeah, my name is Wes Taylor. I graduated from Michigan in 04, but actually that 04 is kind of, um, it's not necessarily the time that I was at Michigan. I was actually there closer to when Sinkor and Yvette were there. Um, the majority of my time, and actually me and Sinkor also have this overlap of being very social at the time and hanging out at Michigan, um, which is interesting because I don't think me and Segura ever had a conversation about the art school while we were at Michigan. Um, but I would say um, my work deals with a lot of things. And then my piece in the, the show is a sliver of my practice, which revolves around performance work, interactive installation, architecture, um, music that has to deal with um, hip hop and electronic art that came out of Southeast Michigan from the mid nineties to now. Um, a lot of the work that I do with my current um, collective complex movements, uh, which, which includes 
um, another U of M alum, uh, Carlos Garcia, um, other people from Michigan, Il Weaver, MC and Lyricist, YG, um, who is a producer and a DJ, and Sage Crump, who's actually located in New Orleans, but is a cultural strategist. Um, we've been making work based that thinks about the intersection of complex science and movement making. And a lot of that thinking comes from um, the elders from Detroit, specifically uh, people who have mentored us in, in thought and in knowledge production, such as Grace Lee Boggs, um, um, Gloria House, AKA Mama Neb, um, who are the people that their knowledge has inspired the work that we do in like trying to translate their philosophies and their experiences as, as activists and thinkers into visual and performative work. Um, and, and so the work that I was doing that I put in the show is a sliver of what originated a lot of that, which was being involved in hip hop in Ann Arbor as a teenager uh, going to high school in Ann Arbor, moving from Detroit, um, living on family housing and, and trying to like tap into this cultural movement that was happening all, happening all over the nation. And we were trying to have it happen in Ann Arbor um, in the worst way. And so this is a lot of the production from that time. And the other thing was, this was a meditation on my time at Michigan, which I felt like was excising a lot of trauma um, at during the time that I was there. And so this reflection was actually about knowledge production. Um, and so I was thinking about the music that we were making and then overlapping that with the words and thoughts of Stefano Harney and, and Fred Moten. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you, Wes. Uh, this was uh, wonderfully informative and quite intriguing. I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Youngblond. Um, who is our fourth alum with us today. Oh, Elizabeth, you're muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, I was just saying thank you for the show. It's wonderful to be acknowledged by your alma mater. Um, I graduated in 73. Um, I have a very kind of strange trajectory. I was a ceramics major when I was at the University of Michigan. I had um, also worked though at university publications and had background in design. So my uh, professional career for decades had been as a graphic designer working here and in New York and um, and since and I've also taught including a stint at University of Michigan and after teaching and designing I've uh, and I should say concurrently really I always kind of went in and out of crafts basically uh, first ceramics then weaving, I would go to Penland or Haystack. I took a, um, I did a residency at University of the Arts when I moved out of New York. So I have, um, I've learned to weave at different points in my life and they all kind of come together. Um, they all have a, a thread. Um, a lot of it comes from the idea of making and craft um, based, believe it or not, the line drawings come from the weavings, are based in the weavings. Um, uh, the, there's some ceramic work that doesn't, isn't um, represented here, but those come from the line drawings and the line draw, from the line drawings come those large graphite forms that you see um, will show up there. And the silver pieces come after that. So um, my practice is pretty interior. It really does not um, have much to do with other people. It has to do with me and my thinking processes and working through each of these is a different way of processing thought and ideas. And um, I think I'll leave it there. 
Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. This is really exciting uh, for me um, viewing uh, this exhibition, but especially hearing all of you speak about your work and your practice and how that speaks about a remarkable institution that STAMS and the University of Michigan are and how they have instilled a new uh, complex and broad perspectives um, about life and creative life uh, through art practice. Just seeing your work and diversity of the work, but more uh, than just diversity of practices, seeing the complexities of questions from your um, elegant, almost mysteriously enigmatic uh, um, works, Elizabeth, to really kind of uh, uh, exciting edge of uh, Wes's work, like kind of, I, I felt a rhythm suddenly change from Elizabeth to uh, uh, Wes and then Sanger being kind of a, a really uh, um, a practitioner, almost I wanna say a painter as, as if painter is a kind of a carpenter or a builder uh, and, and the kind of poetics that come from that sort of rudimentary practice to Yvette's work, which is complex, bringing elements of uh, tangible materials that art practice brings to mind to more of sort of urgency that a performative act uh, uh, brings into uh, art making, really exciting. Um, I really want to thank you for uh, sharing your perspectives. Uh, and I would like us to um, go into a discussion uh, by going around and um, asking questions of a specific person. But please, uh, by all means, um, chime in uh, organically. Uh, I will have some specific questions, but everybody is really there to respond. Uh, so my first question is, can you share with us your personal experience of being an artist and student at the University of Michigan campus and more specifically STAMS? Uh, I'm gonna ask Wes to uh, get us start off uh, as um, well, at least by the date of graduation as our most recent uh, uh, along. Um, okay. Um, I mean, I think as, as I mentioned, like my work was a reflection of that time of, of thinking about it um, as being a student. Um, and I, I think it was really complex because <clears throat> one coming from Ann Arbor as coming from middle school and then high school coming to Ann Arbor coming from Ann Arbor to Michigan um, was a slightly different experience because I was familiar with the place um, in a lot of different ways. And also my family was very much involved in Michigan. My dad uh, got his PhD in public health from there. My mom was um, um, in the admissions department and was recruiting a lot of people from Detroit and in Chicago. Um, it was a really interesting time because it was almost like every black student at Michigan knew my mom that was from Detroit or Chicago. And, and, mm. and so like a lot of them was like, your mom let us in because this was a time of on-site admissions and in a, a time long past when there were actually black students at Michigan. Um, so that was really, that was really interesting. And then also like knowing like the struggle that I had when I, first started in the, the School of Natural Resources, um, it was a lifelong dream of mine as, you know, an 18 year old to be an environmentalist. Um, and, and that kind of shifted and went into the arts for a whole lot of reasons. And then I was able to transfer into the arts. And, and these, there are also people that guided me that were there. I don't know if Carolina Wheat, um, who was also part of the, the hip hop scene in, in Michigan was also in the office and she helped like shepherd, shepherd me through a lot of, like, a lot of hard times. Um, and 
I remember not feeling like an artist at Michigan or feeling the being empowered as a person who could be an artist or culturally not feeling in alignment of what I was into as like overlapping that with the institution. Um, and so that, that struggle for me um, was tough. And then I, it was also made it doubly tough because I was a touring like musician and making hip hop and traveling mm -hmm. across the country. And I would visit other art schools such as like, um, I don't know, the new school and places like that. And then I would, I would see other things and I would see like these references of like contemporary work being at play within the students. And I was like, I, I was trying to find that at Michigan. It was really, it was really difficult. Um, and so I don't know that, I felt like that led to a lot of like splitting of myself, my character, my persona, my identity, um, even myself as a black black person expressing blackness in the school was also really tough, and I felt a lot of struggle of that. Um, and so, I I I felt like I crawled out of there, but I gained a lot. And you know, I can talk about some of the things that I gained, but I think a lot of that had to do with like the humanities, writing. Um, this art historical approach that I still use to this day um, that I can I can wield at certain times and um, and 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 have I draw on a lot of those experiences even with like certain grants and grant writing and things like that that have done well I feel like have proven well for me and I can attribute that to my time in Michigan. Yeah, uh, thank you, Wes. Um, I think this is really exciting for me to hear uh, from your perspective about being here, I almost feel that energy um, of wrestling um, the school being a young student trying to navigate through all those complexities within uh, seemingly limited parameters of a studio or a classroom or a lab uh, but also finding ways for your voice to be heard. And I think as someone like myself who has experience in music, I studied classical music only to switch to folk and dance music. Um, I see that kind of wrestling manifest itself in the creative practice that is evident in your work uh, today. So um, I think that's really exciting to hear you speak about it. I have a question for Sanger. Um, Sanger, you were at STAMS in the late 1990s. Um, I, can you speak about resources um, that um, impacted your time at STAMS and at the university? Human resources, classes, uh, like, uh, uh, nails and hammers to printing presses, whatever it was around that kind of triggered that moment of discovery for you? Well, um, sure, I, I, you know, for, for me, I really, I entered U of M, I, I graduated from Cass Technical High School and I graduated as a, as a, a senior. Uh, my last semester, I finally achieved the impossible. I, I got a 4.0 GPA. Uh, and so I went into Michigan, like on a mission. Um, just, I was very serious. Um, I, I had a very clear understanding of why I was, I was at U of M. And from the very beginning, I actually started in the bridge program. So I started in the summer. Um, and so from the very beginning, um, I was introduced on our first tour to all of these incredible resources at the university. Uh, from the libraries to the, um, uh, you know, these big, huge spaces filled with computers. Um, you know, my, my brother who, you know, went, uh, attended another university uh, in the South, you know, they had like, I don't know, 10 computers for the whole campus. And, you know, U of M, I had a computing site right down <laughs> on the first floor of my dormitory. And so, um, whatever it is that I wanted to engage in intellectually, the school had somewhere for me to go, 
some stacks for me to dig through, um, you know, and, and, and resources in terms of people studying under um, uh, Jim Cogswell, Al Hinton, uh, Vincent Costignacci, uh, Takeshi Takahara, mm -hmm. also did a lot of uh, art history with Matthew Biro. Uh, my mentor when I was there uh, was Dr. Ralph Story in the uh, Conferences Studies program. And so I had people that, that I could always reach out to who were professionals in their fields, uh, whether it be writing or art. Um, and, you know, I could go to the library. I, I went up to uh, North Campus uh, one time uh, to the library up there. And uh, I, I cannot remember what class it was. We were in a class and uh, went to the library and we all put on these white gloves. And we went through and we looked at original Joseph Albers works on paper. And I'm just like, I'm, you know, 19, 20 years old. And I'm looking at, I have million dollar artworks, <laughs> you know, in my hand that are at my disposal that I can use, that I can study. Um, and, and so then I would take, you know, looking at Joseph Albers and, and what I had learned uh, from Mr. Costignacci in his color theory class. And I would take that, uh, leave class, go hang out with Wes and, and our friends, and we'd be listening to music and mm -hmm. talk about music. Um, and then I would make work that was sort of influenced by, you know, the, the people that I was around, the music, the culture that was happening at the school, and then mix it sort of with this sort of intellectual um, artistic, theoretical kind of thing, and, and, and I was trying to figure out how to make things work um, and, and figuring out how do I take um, all of these things that I can use from the university and make it fit more in what I want to say and express um, as an individual um, and, and express from a, you know, coming from a, a, a Detroit boy who grew up listening to hip hop and, and jazz every day, you know, like trying to mix those two together. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the university just had everything I needed to, to help cultivate, um, um, you know, that intersection and, and that um, combining of elements that, that, that I was doing. Um, you know, it, it seems to me you were clearly pointing out at, at the kind of grandeur of the University of Michigan as this very special place, and um, the one that you know provided these resources for you to thrive. But what I'm also sensing is this wonderful community. You are there with Yvette and Wes and other artists and people and and uh, like thinkers, makers, like in these sort of nooks and corners of of various buildings and places and it's in that kind of inner dialogue that uh, amazing synergy was created that has lasted now you know for more than two decades and has impacted your practice and your life uh, of an artist and cultural worker and, and educator I think that's really amazing to hear about um, thank you Sanger uh, I have a question for Elizabeth um, Elizabeth, you um, were at STAMS uh, in the early days of STAMS uh, in the 1970s. Uh, that place uh, I would, or I could only imagine uh, was a considerably um, a, a different kind of environment. And, um, you know, I'm curious about um, hearing more about a couple of things, like the kind of mentorship that, um, happened there uh, uh, for you uh, to start, you know, defining yourself as an artist uh, and cultural worker and, and, and a voice in the community, but also how you today as an established artist with such long and illustrious career and practice uh, help support and mentor uh, the next generation of artists. Well, that's a really good question. Um, my time there, I guess I felt like I was 
things were really pretty open. Um, and the, I, if there was anything in retrospect, I wish I would had more mentoring than I did. Um, what I would consider the, the, the situations and the people that I recall and feel like gave me, I would say mentorship, meaning conversations in their offices and specific uh, personal advice about the work um, were I think two people. I'd say Minionette Chang. But first of all, I'd say, yes, the school was very different. It wasn't stamps then, um, but Minionette Chang. And I remember um, taking an, and I was an independent study where I really got to explore um, some of the form, the kind of form that I'm actually working with now. Um, somebody once described my art making career as a slow burn mm. in the essay project. And that's very, very true because it's been off and on in, be, you know, in between very long periods of very serious graphic design. Um, and the second person that I took a, a independent study with that I remember very clearly is Diane Kirkpatrick. In the, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers her in, in um, the art history department, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and she really sort of just kind of, you know, would push me in this direction a little bit and then push me in that direction a little bit to get this, you know, big long term paper written, which was kind of the only thing that I turned in for her for that semester. And I remember a real and just real specific information that Minionette Chang um, uh, gave that I still kind of hear in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was fortunate enough when I taught there, she was still teaching there. So I got to, you know, kind of have a little bit of um, interplay with her as a, as a budding adult. I was really pretty young. I was in my twenties when I taught there. So I, again, in, in retrospect, it's with this much um, this time between then and now, it's just real interesting to kind of see how, um, uh, how little I knew and how much I wandered. And it was basically pretty safe. I didn't get in any big trouble. <laughs> and, and I actually managed to pick up some things along the way that really, uh, again, with, with hindsight, you see how there's this thread all the way across and there are people, you know, when I did my graduate work at Cranbrook, I met Ed Fella. I don't know if, how many people know Ed, but um, I was given a talk maybe two years ago and um, it was, you know, it was about my, my artwork and Ed happened to be in town because he lives in California now um, he happened to be here and he came to the talk. And so he was familiar with my work as a student and as a, a recent graduate, because I did a lot of freelance for, um, anyway, so he watched my work develop as a graphic designer early. And here he was looking at my um, non-graphic design work, I don't know, certainly 30 years later, and he could see the thread he could see the aesthetic, you know, thread that ties the uh, that ties them all together, and I can see it too. Um, but it's that's really very interesting yeah. to me, at least. <laughs> um, and as far as what I do uh, to support um, the generation behind me, I have to say, when I'm not teaching. I don't know, except to be there and to be available. Mm. Um, I have, um, I kind of have dipped in and out of going to Cranbrook since my leaving there. Uh, for many years, I didn't even want to go as far as Birmingham, frankly, after my graduation from Cranbrook, but that's another story. Um, but since um, coming back, it's been a very different experience and I try to make myself available without being intrusive. I let, mm -hmm. let them know I'm there and um, 
you know, but I don't want to be the old person that follows young people around pestering them. <laughs> hmm. um, thank you, Elizabeth. What I hear is a really interesting um, kind of thread of uh, reflections going back and forth between specific place and places which you uh, inhabited as uh, a creative mind and creative maker kind of uh, like rubbing off of good energies, but also probably even challenging energies around you to begin to uh, look and, and, and identify voice that is within you and, and to uh, really stick with that for a, a lifelong journey. And I think I see something very uh, uh, powerful in your work, which at first does not jump at you, but at the same time, it brings these kind of rudimentary questions that are um, meticulously woven within uh, seemingly uh, elegant abstractions that you have done in your work in fibers and, and sculpture and, and drawing. And then, you know, um, just understanding your place within the community uh, of Detroit and Southeastern Michigan, having encountered you a number of years at the Detroit Artist Market in an exhibition that I curated uh, of contemporary women uh, printmakers working in relief printmaking, that your presence there was felt in the community, that you, through your work and, and uh, life uh, as, as an artist and, and uh, cultural worker, have impacted people uh, even without necessarily thinking of how you measure that. So that's, I think, really an important um, uh, thing to, 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 to recognize. Yeah. And if I might jump back in, I tend to, now that I'm making art, I tend to sort of not talk about my design life, but I taught for many years and I had lots and lots of students come through classes and occasionally I bump into somebody. In fact, I was doing a show, a holiday pop-up and a young woman came up to me who had been a student at Michigan and we talked about typography and, you know, and some of the, all those, those interesting, um, what do you want to call it? Strictures, I guess I would call it that we, the way, in ways we thought about, talk about typography. So, you know, I, I guess it's been, um, I feel like, I guess I've done it informally, even though I was teaching formally. And, um, but as an artist, it's very informal because I'm not teaching that in most cases, only rarely with experimental classes and ceramics and so forth. But, so Thank yeah, you. I'll stop. Yeah. Um, Yvette, I have a question uh, for you that I hope uh, can trigger other uh, responses as well. Um, you know, your practice really um, uh, um, examines societal systems of oppression. You also, through your work, uh, foster uh, a passion for community um, and, 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 and art that sort of both challenges but also brings people uh, together. And so uh, with that in mind, um, uh, how through your work you examine but also break the barriers uh, of um, systems of oppression and injustice. And, and I hope that everybody sort of can chime in as, as you uh, 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 respond to this question. Okay, you broke up a little bit for me, but I think you uh -huh. want me to respond to uh, how my work talks and speaks to systems of oppression, as well as how it's related to community that I'm right. working with and impacting, impacting so forth. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, well, I have a question, I guess. First, how many people does it take to make community? I mean, just kind of put your fingers up. 
at least how many people? Well, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna... So no, this is this is always what I'm saying, why I'm asking this question. So in my mind, it takes at least two people. Um, so you have to like come out of yourself to engage in, mm -hmm. with someone else. And I recall when I, um, I started an after school program in my neighborhood in 2003. And I remember working with other college students who would come and volunteer and so forth. And they would be so discouraged and frustrated when maybe only like one student came to the program. Or mm. And I would have to regularly tell them it is not about large masses of people. If you have this one person that you're able to spend time with an impact, that's a beautiful thing. You're forming a community with this one person and you are giving of yourself to this one person. So that's a that's like a, a pretty important philosophy for me personally, as I'm engaging in work that I'm not looking for like thousands of audiences or I'm not, I'm not seeking that out, you know, when it comes to community engagement. It's really, it's such a natural um, outflow of my own life. It's just, I'm not forcing it. And so in my work, like in, in the show, the community conversations pieces, these are literally like, I can tell you all the, it's just my neighbors mm -hmm. around here. And these are real discussions we're having. It's a pretty diverse neighborhood and we're having these discussions. And so it's important for me, like I said in the intro that the work I'm doing when I'm addressing systems of oppression or injustice, it's because that's what's happening around me. and art is the art that comes from that is very it's uh very natural it's like breathing it's just something something that's happening it's happening in my mind a lot and then when i go to the studio i have an opportunity to maybe put some flesh to those thoughts and and playing around with the different materials um that i have i also have a, a gallery that i started in 2012, and that's our mission statement. We foster, uh, you know, transforming lives and neighborhoods through uh, art, community, and education. And so that's those are the three models that I pretty much live by for my own gallery and in my artistic practice. Um, I think, for example, like the project we're doing now as a gallery is called Aired Out Quilts, and that involves interviewing eight to 10 um, native or like long time, at least 20 years Detroiters and capturing their story, turning it into a contemporary freedom quilt and relating it to the freedom quilts from the past and then airing those quilts out in the public to share those people's stories. And at the end, we're giving the quilt back to the interviewees after it's been exhibited and so forth. So it's just important to tell those stories for me as an artist, um, and I think it's connected to also even my past. I'm a political asylee from Suriname. That's where mm -hmm. I'm originally from. And I, you know, you're not just like some, you don't just like my time at Michigan didn't just for me or my time at Cooper Union didn't just make me who I was or my time in Miami, Florida and New World School of the Arts didn't form. It's like all these stages coming from South America, my mm -hmm. mom's country, and then Florida, and then New York. Then Michigan, you know, I never heard of Michigan until I like went to college, you know, in the school. So all these lifelong journeys impact how we make our work. They they for they inform us and allow us to share with, you know, others who we are and the things that that matter to us. So I continue to now through performance art uh, tell this tell a very similar story. Just continue to tell the stories that are around me. So when I'm painting, I actually now, it's automatic. I start thinking of a performance. It's just, it's really interesting, the relationship now with my body and making the work. And the last performance I did called uh, 400 Years of Labor, look at where I perform it in wearing bell, 400 bells. Well, a lot of them fell off during the performance, but mm -hmm. I sewed 400 bells on a garment and perform it with the six foot by three foot painting, mixed media painting that I did. And so like, you know, it's just a different way of interacting now with the world and with my own art um, through my body and through the mixed media work that I make. So 
it's important for me as an artist to just keep just keep experimenting just keep trying new things mm -hmm. not worrying so much about the result but really like getting into the experience <clears throat> itself is important so. yeah i'd like um, i wanted to sort of uh piggyback on um on Yvette's comments of, about community um, and, and just sort of go back to my time at U of M and, you know, I think we often forget, you know, because of U of M, uh, Andy, you mentioned, you used the word grandeur, um, you know, the grandeur of our beloved sports teams and rah, rah, rah. Um, but, you know, U of M in Ann Arbor has a long history of cultivating protest and, and uh, cultivating activists and activism. Um, and I can remember my time there, um, you know, we were, you know, my, my sort of cohort becoming, we were sort of coming on the, the end heels of like the BAM movement from the 70s and 80s. And, um, you know, we were sort of carrying the torch, but we were kind of handed the torch and, and had to sort of carry it in a different, in a different kind of way. Um, and, and there were all these different communities at U of M, um, and I was lucky enough. I, I did not live on North Campus. I'm so glad I didn't. I uh, lived on uh, up on the hill, and and James Cousins, and I like really, um, I, I really was able to immerse myself, you know, sort of in the thick of the university itself. And so, like my time at the art school was sort of like its own little bubble or silo. And then I had my, my friends, you know, me, uh, me and Wes and, and uh, uh, Kwanzaa and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, the rest of the athletic Mike League would go and, and we would be doing our hip hop thing. And I could leave that group. I had another group of friends that I could roll with. And, but everyone was always talking about um, doing something. How, how do we fight against this? Or, or, you know, what are we going to do about this situation uh, that's happening globally? Um, you know, what role can we play? And, and how, you know, and for me, I was always thinking about, well, how can I sort of mix what I'm learning as a student and use that to my advantage in, in, in fighting systems of oppression and doing it in a way that fits with who I am and, and, and what I'm about. Um, and, and there were times where I would want to speak my mind and, and, and say things. I remember talking to my dad and saying, well, you know, I want to talk about this in my art. I want to do that. And he was like, listen, son, nobody cares about what you have to say right now. You know, what you want to do is cultivate, you know, sort of cultivate your ideas and your, and your mind and your mentality and your goals and what you want to do in your life. But right now, take what you're learning at the university uh, and, and figure out how to use that so that it can bring more agency and more power to your voice, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and you can kind of get your feet wet here, you know, in Ann Arbor, um, but, but really you're preparing yourself for, a, you know, a, a, a bigger, a, a, you know, a more long-term uh, sort of mission um, as, a, as a human being, as an artist, as a creative, in that, you know, you, you got to sort of think more long term. And, you know, U of M had for me, um, you know, it was like a, a, a proving ground, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of the things that I would end up doing, you know, later on as, as an artist, as a, as a, um, you know, person who works heavily in the community. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sanger. And uh, I, I, I just want to, before we uh, wrap up and move to q and A, I I want to say something really, um, how, how, um, how much of this resonates with me being part of U of M and STAMS. Listening to Yvette uh, speaking about things that in my own personal story I can relate to, uh, making me realize that we all in so many ways slap baggage of sort, uh, which always essentially reflects uh, places that we have been part of, whether we, you know, have been in one place, but sort of reflecting on the community locally, or whether we have moved from one part of the globe to another, there's always this kind of sense of 
as you put Sanger um, uh, uh, finding agency to, to do the kind of groundwork day after day and just listening to Yvette speaking about her neighborhood and starting the gallery and sort of living life as if you have always only been just part of uh, that neighborhood is remarkable uh, because I think uh, your true self comes through many different uh, um, identities, but it's in that collection of voices that you project that a true um, uh, unified vo voice uh, identifies itself. Uh, so with that in mind, I want to thank you all uh, for sharing these uh, uh, remarkable perspectives with us. We have about 10 minutes um, for Q&A from the audience. Jennifer and I will be engaging uh, through these questions. Um, if you can type your questions in the chat, uh, we will ask them of, um, we will ask the artists to respond. Uh, if it is more comfortable and you feel that you want to ask those questions uh, in person, feel free to do so. So on that note, we are now engaging with the audience. And again, thank you so much for sharing so willingly and enthusiastically about you, your practice and, and your experience. And maybe we can just start, you know, Libby Post um, uh, added a question to the chat. I don't know if Libby is still with us. Um, maybe not. I can go ahead and ask it. And I feel like, you know, Singor, you were kind yes. of touching on this already a little bit, um, but maybe, you know, throw it out to any of the other artists too. Um, she wrote, you know, would love to hear Singor and, and others respond to this. How do you feel your work creates an impetus for activists, I think she's saying activists, to take action. Um, if you are thinking about that, um, mm -hmm. is that something that you are thinking about when you're making your work? Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to. And Libby is with us, I see Libby. Oh, okay, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Hey, Libby, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> it's good, Mr. Reed. <laughs> Um, I, you know, for, for me, um, and I, I sort of talked about that a little bit in the in my intro, you know, there are times as artists where we get to a point and where we ask ourselves, you know, like, why am I doing this? You know, what, you, you know, you, you, you make a body of work and you, you've written this artist statement, but you wrote the artist statement really for the gallery, <laughs> you know, and, and then you have to like, sort of go back and reread it and like, well, this isn't what my work is about at all, you know? And, and, you know, there was a moment where I had to begin to think about, like, I know what it is that I want my art to be, but I wasn't always aware of thinking about what it is that I want my art to do. You know, how do I want my art to activate a space? How do I want my art to affect people? I know, I know how I want it to affect and look to me, but, um, you know, how, how do I think about the audience in a way that doesn't necessarily compromise um, what I want to express, but still have the awareness and the, the, the observation of self to know that, okay, when I put this on a wall, it's going to have this effect on people. It's going to make people want to do this or that. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I think that you have to do that. It doesn't mean that you have to you know, if you want to make your art be an impetus for activism, it doesn't mean that you have to make art that want that, that's going to make people go out and, and protest. You know, I think that you you first want to make art that is going to going to be introspective for people. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to bring something different to a work, mm -hmm. um, and and you want something your work to be a catalyst for something, um, and, and and you want it to spark in the audience. Um, you know, some sort of reaction that is going to push them to make a change, make an adjustment, make a move, take action, uh, move into a meditation. You know, I mean, it, it's going to mean something different um, for everyone. But I, I think in the making and in the and in the practice, I think it's important to to think about that. What is my art going to do uh, when I present it and communicate it to a larger audience? 
Thank you, Sanger. Um, anyone else would like to build off of this question that uh, Libby posted and that Sanger so uh, eloquently sure. articulated? I just, just very briefly, the, what comes to mind is that the work we make kind of has a life of its own once we release it. Sure. And um, we cannot control, obviously, how the audience will respond. You'll have people who just, what's the average three seconds, two seconds, look at a work and walk, walk to the next one. And then there are those who are like staring forever, you know, just like it's really speaking to them. Sure. I've had people who like are next to me and they're like crying after they see work. And you don't always, you don't always know the response. So it's important, obviously, that you yourself have reconciled with your work and you're like, I'm ready to put it out there. It's not like we put out everything we make, right? Some work I feel is so sacred, it just stays right in my space and doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, so once you put your work out there, even with all the uh, serious topics and things that like are important to me, like racism and injustice and so forth in education, like uh, it's enough for me just to make the work. That's as a human being, that's my response to the world around me. And if it like inspires you, that's like another level, <laughs> you know, so that's mm. it. Um, well, I, I, I just want to reflect I, I on, wanted to, yeah, oh, I yes, to yes, add, yes. And I, I think uh, Elizabeth wanted to add to that too. So I, um, you can go, I will defer to you. <laughs> um, would you, would you like to, to go and then I'll wait because there's also a, a question from Kayla. So, um, that okay. Can, all right, I was um, I was gonna say I again my work is so personal and so um, indirectly attached to other people that it was kind of it. I guess when Singor started to talk about uh, putting it out there and hoping that it affects people uh, one way or another, and you write statements and so forth. Um, that really does resonate with me because my work is so kind of simple and I hope distilled, that's the way I like to think of it, um, that, you know, it's to slow you down and to, you know, whatever thought you're trying to work out, you know, this is the work for you, you know, to help you do that. That's the way it sits in my head. Um, but I'm you know, I am, maybe it's just insecurity on my part, but uh, like you, Yvette, I just, I've had to release that. You know, I hope that it slows people down. But again, you get that, what'd you say? 30, 30 seconds if you're lucky. And, um, you know, maybe it slows people, maybe it doesn't. And so, yeah, that's something that I've had to, I, I shouldn't say had to wrestle with because it's not like I finished with it. It happens every time, so especially before a show, very inconvenient. That's me, yeah. got it, Wes. And Wes, yes. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I was gonna, just thinking about that in reflection of like working with, like I feel like my practice is very much immersed in activist communities um, and working with activists that slide into art making and then also like there's this education back and forth like this is how movements happen and then this is how art making happens but you know there's this conversation about um cultural strategy um that i think is really interesting and i feel like is at the center of like my practice and um we were there was like this interview and i i think about it this way and this is you know definitely a thing i learned at michigan this this idea of culture wars um, and I'm like, you have to have cultural strategy because there are constant culture wars happening in our society. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so that's really been a call for me to make, quote unquote, I wouldn't say this, but instrumentalist work um, where I feel like sometimes you have to be very didactic and heavy handed in order to not be metaphor 
allegoric in your work in order for change to happen. Um, some, um, and, and, and I think like in, in art schools, the impetus is for you to be metaphoric and allegoric um, and to go against like saying directly, like I'm upset, I'm mad. Um, these things are shunned upon as in art making. Um, but not in not in activist movements, right? Um, and and so there's there's like still these things that have to go and back and forth that need to inform each other. Um, and, and and in thinking about frameworks of of movement making that can be very much system within systems making and creating of like language that is visual, that is sound, that speaks to um, these ideas of how people move together, how people can resonate with one with one another, but with purpose of, in the purpose of changing things. Um, and, and I think there are many practices, especially within activist communities that understand how to facilitate people, how to move people. And I think when we talk about silos, sometimes those different worlds actually don't communicate. Cause like, even with the emphasis of like art making, um, a lot of times going away from being direct, you also have this questioning within activist movements to say, well, what does art and culture sometimes really offer to something that it needs to be very practical? Um, and, and so like bridging these things is sometimes a struggle. Um, and it's also very exciting to me. And I find that's where like my work tries to muck up those waters um, with other people. And, and I feel like in doing that type of work, my practice is very collaborative. So I rarely think about myself as a solo artist. Um, I'm always working with others in order to make change and being immersed in things and causes in order to um, do that. And going back to Yvette's question, you know, you know, what does it do to make community? Like, what do you need to make community? I think I'm always thinking about that. Um, as as a question as an artist, like how am I in community with the people I need to be in communicate like community with in order to do things that are larger than myself? Um, and and, and th those are questions that you know can be daunting at times, but um, I feel I feel really exciting when you know working with and talking about prison abolition and and working with BYP one hundred. On making installation work um, and other abolitionist movements uh, of, of thinking about how do we get rid of prisons with people working on getting rid of prisons. Um, and, and I think that's really important. Mm. Uh, Wes, I, I appreciate you being so um, uh, kind of open and generous speaking about collaboration and I think collaboration in its manifestation uh, always uh, brings a potential to bring um, others into the equation that may not be part of the same pack. Like, um, I don't know how to say this. Uh, growing up, I could not quite uh, fully understand the roots of jazz but I understood the energy that was kind of pulling me in. Now I have a very different reading of, of that experience, even though it's not mine, but it did subsequently became part of my uh, uh, formative experience in Yugoslavia. Um, and I sort of wanna say one thing that uh, deeply resonated with me tonight, which I oftentimes share with my students that we, through our work, especially creative work, art and creative practice, have tendency to push strengths and our convictions. But what also comes forth are our vulnerabilities, our inner selves, the, the voice of human and the humility and fundamentally empathy of, of us as human beings. But I think of that as one of the greatest strengths because it, it does prompt 
this argument, what is the role of art and culture? And uh, why is it so eclectic and so diverse and so multifaceted? And for me, it has always been a bridge, like a way to enter a portal that I may never fully understand or be part of, but at least get that vibe that will resonate with me and make me move from those three seconds to maybe five, a minute or three to stay out of trouble and reach out and sort of understand that other voice coming uh, towards me. And I think all of you project that hope uh, uh, in my view. All of you also project urgency, but I really see a tremendous amount of hope. And that to me is always a beginning of something new and something better. Um, I really want to uh, thank Melissa uh, uh, Shrimoy and Jennifer of Stam's uh, gallery, the curatorial theme that has worked so hard um, on this project from the beginning um, and uh, all the artists that have um, just brought so much more tonight, um, especially during this uh, complicated time that uh, we live in. Uh, you speak of resilience, you speak about strength, uh, and you also speak about hope. And for me, um, Art is the greatest form of hope. And, and that um, is always a beginning of something new and something better. So on that note, I wanna thank uh, everybody uh, for being here today and engaging in this important conversation. I want to thank especially the alums who are part of this. And I wanna turn um, this uh, uh, wonderful and lively conversation tonight to Melissa uh, um, uh, as we wrap up today's uh, event. All right, thank you, Andy, for moderating the event. And to our four alumni artists, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us this evening. This conversation has been just great. Thank you, Jennifer and Montagnola for sharing more information on this the exhibition and the gallery. And thank you to everybody who was able to attend. I know we ran over by about 15 minutes. So thank you so much for hanging with us. Um, this conversation has really offered us an opportunity to come together as a community. And I appreciate that all of you were able to do that with us. So I'll be sending out a recording of the event after this for you to rewatch or share with others. And thanks again for taking the time. I hope you all have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jamie. Thank you. Hi, Charlene. Hi, Angie. <laughs>